imaginary damage, conditional bonus crit rate and crit damage. You would think that this bad boy would be like the best in slot gear for your boy Dan Hung, aka Imbibita Lune, aka Danielle. And don't get me wrong my guys, this thing is great. If you pre-farmed it like I did, all good. However, have you heard of the critically acclaimed Musketeer of the Wild Wheat set, boasting a 12% attack as well as a 6% speed, but most importantly, a fat 10% bonus to your basic attack damage. Our boy Daniel has the majority of his damage loaded into his basic attacks, like pa pa pa. He's also attack scaling and speed is always good, unless your name is Clara, in which case, it's kind of debatable. And so because of that, and a couple of other things that we'll talk about later in the video, Musketeers is actually an incredibly competitive set for him. That was the first thing that you should know about Dan Hung in Bibita Lune. Today, I've got a total of 12, and here are the other 11. Hi, I'm Lace. Let's start by quickly going over what exactly it is our Dragon Bro does. So our bro is imaginary and he is on the path of destruction, but TLDR, he is a giga cracked DPS. Basic attack can be charged up to three times and this is extremely important because all of the damage simulations you're gonna see, like from everyone's favorite Sims 4 gamer Grimro or the CM bros from Billy Billy, they're all going to assume that you're max stacking the basic attack every single time. The TLDR is that you spend three skill points or three of these charges or a mix of both, do single target damage, then AOE damage. And if you do anything else but this, it's a DPS loss. And when you see that Danielle topping the charts on that tier list over there, that is not your Danielle. That's somebody's Danielle, but it's not yours. And that, my guys, is number two. And because the stacking mechanism uses the E key, there is no longer any space for a skill. Therefore, he has no skill. Instead, what we get is a Yu-Gi-Oh level wall of text. Now, what really matters out of all of this is that if you decide to stack two or three skill points, you'll get an additional 12% crit damage buff that stacks up to four times. At four max stacks, 48% extra crit damage, these things last until the end of his turn. You know what else lasts until the end of his turn? His talent right over here, Righteous Heart, in which every time he attacks, he gets plus 10% damage. And this bad boy stacks up to six times, therefore plus 60% damage at max stacks. Now, again, these stacks last until the end of the turn. Why exactly is it so important that I'm repeating myself? Because immediately after your turn ends, you're gonna lose all of those stacks, all six of these ones and all four of these ones over here. What this does mean though, is that if he manages to get his ultimate as a result of the energy regeneration from his normal attack, then you've got to mash it so that he activates his extra turn for his ultimate whilst he's still in the turn with the buffs. If you manage to pull it off, then his ultimate is going to have an extra 60% damage and 48% crit damage. That my guys, is number three. And speaking of the ultimate, it's essentially a massive amount of AOE damage, which also, by the way, stacks the talent, so this guy right here, but it does not stack the skill at all, because this one is completely dependent on the enhanced basic attacks. However, the greatest thing about the ultimate is that it gives us two charges of the Squama Sacra Sancta charges. Yep, those ones right there. Now, there is another situation that we are going to find ourselves in, and that is when we enter his turn and his ultimate is going to be up. Age old question, since the beginning of time, do we use the enhanced basic attack first so that we can charge up for the big ultimate, charge up these stacks, as well as these ones over here. So charge up six stacks, four stacks with enhanced basic attack, and then ultimate after that, or do we use it afterwards? In these situations, I personally prefer to always run the ultimate first because from the three hits, it's going to give us three stacks of the Righteous Heart, giving us 30% damage. And then after that, we'll use the enhanced basic attack to deal the big juicer. On top of that, however, we'll also be getting the energy back by playing this way, which means faster ultimates. And faster ultimates for our dear Danielle means better skill point economy because of these two to three charges. You can certainly play it the other way around. So using your enhanced basic attack, you do the seven hits, you get six stacks of this and four stacks of this, uh, this one over here, and then using your ultimate, which is gonna do big damage. However, I generally play it with the ultimate into the enhanced basic attack. And that, my guys, is number four. Okay, so I just touched on why we want the faster ultimates. There are generally two ways to get faster ultimates. The first is more actions, either via speed or action advance via like your Bronyas. Or the other option is to use Tingyun, who quite literally just gives you straight energy. On top of that, however, Tingyun also gives you plus damage, plus attack, all extremely relevant buffs, 
for our Daniel. That, my guys, is number five. Okay, so we're pretty much done with this kit. Let me just quickly cover the rest because there is one more important aspect that we'll use for the next part. For the major traces, he's got 35% CC resist. Fantastic. At the start of the battle, immediately regen 15 energy, which would potentially help you one turn the MOCs. And lastly, we've got a 24% crit damage buff against imaginary weak enemies, which is utterly fantastic. However, what I really wanted to talk about were the minor traces, which are these ones here. And so in total, he gets about 10% HP, 12% crit rate, and 22.4% imaginary damage. That is some really freaking crazy substats and it gives us a lot of opportunity. Now, first, keep in mind about this 12% crit rate thing. It is going to affect our gear and a lot of decisions regarding our team comp as well as our light cones. But my guys, what you are going to notice is that we've talked a lot about like crit rate, crit damage, and damage buffs. Like that is all baked into his kit. However, we've not heard too much from attack. And if we have a look at the damage formula over here, there is a lot going on in the purple section thanks to his talent his minor traces and eventually the orb and there's also a crit multiplier which for some reason isn't up here however as a general rule you want to be kind of like increasing all aspects of this equation so you want some damage percent multiplier some defense down you want some damage taken multiplier and you also want to increase your base damage now base damage for Imbibita Lune, it is going to be dependent on his attack stat, which is this one over here. And so again, because we have so much like imaginary damage bonus, crit rate, crit damage, but not really very much attack, attack is actually going to be more important for Imbibita Lune than it is for other characters. And that, my guys, is number six. All right, let's talk about something that could really screw up your Imbibita Lune. And so with a base crit rate of 5%, the minor trace of 12% from before, a crit rate body for 32.4%, and arena slash Salsotto gear effect for 8%. This is going to give us a total of 57% crit rate without anything else. However, before we move forward, I do want to say that we're definitely going to be running at this point a crit rate body with the Rutilant Arena because the Rutilant Arena buffs our enhanced basic attacks. And generally speaking, the damage distribution between the enhanced basic attack and the ultimate it's going to be majority in the enhanced basic attack. So we want to use arena. That is number seven. But again, back to the crit rates, it is going to total a 57% without anything else. Therefore, to make the Rutilant Arena threshold at 70%, we need 13%. And on average, every substat for crit rate hits at about 2.9%. Therefore, you're going to require about four to five hits or even just like at the 2.9% of a base substat to be able to make that 70% threshold. And and honestly, with average luck, that's not too hard. However, let's say that you do make it to the 70% crit rate. Here's where it gets a little bit spicy. Because if you are considering Yukong as a support, remember that she actually gives almost 30% crit rate on her ultimate. And so that is going to take us, if we're at 70% for Rutilant Arena, 70 plus 30, it's going to take us to 100%. And so therefore, let's say like you did pull all of this off and you have like 75 or even 80% crit rate, which isn't really unheard of. Then with Yukong, you're going to overcap on crit. And that overcapped crit is literally useless. Therefore, if you insist on using Yukong, then I would recommend a crit rate on your Danielle of 70%, as close to 70% as possible. And that, my guys, is number eight. All right, and so before I move on, I did want to give a quick summary on his preferred gears. At this point in time, crit rate body, speed or attack shoes, because remember, attack is worth more to him than it does to the majority of other characters. And if you combine Danielle with attack boots and Bronya, that's just a good time. However, there is justification for running speed boots on him, especially if you already have a good pair of speed boots in the Musketeer Wheat set. And the reason is because that piece is actually reusable. There are a lot of characters that would use speed boots, even if it's offset. Attack boots, a little bit less so. And so that's number nine, be efficient. As for the Orbi, imaginary damage, and for the rope, 
attack. And in terms of the set effects for the planar ornaments, we're looking at, again, Rutilant Arena. But now that you've seen this crit rate situation, you can actually see why I prefer the Musketeer set, which gives attack and speed and basic attack damage, over this one, which gives you crit rate, which you may overcap with, and crit damage, which of course is still good. However, both of them are kind of conditional. I'm not a big fan of especially this condition right here. And so that's the end of the gears section. However, hold that thought on the crit rate overcapping because it's relevant for what we're going to talk about next, which is our light cones right here. Signature light cone, attack buff, energy regeneration buff, and more crit rates. A whopping 18% crit rate. This changes everything because if you are going to be running this bad boy right here then i would actually highly recommend that you run the crit damage body so no percentage crit rate for that one because if you're now running the light cone and you also have the imaginary set on this is probably the one instance i would use it then you would actually get to 53 percent crit rate therefore only needing 17 percent crit rate which does translate to about six hits if you manage to get this i think you're dan hung your danielle is going to be a literal god, is number 10. However, for the rest of us peasants, there is a clear winner among all of these, and it's on the fall of an Aeon. What's that? At S5, 16% times 4 stacks, 64% attack? That's pretty freaking good. I'm not going to explain why. Again, you guys are probably sick of it. However, there is one thing that I did not mention before, and it's to do with Danielle's breaking. Our Dragon Boy is actually way better at breaking than everyone else. And the reason is because whilst his ultimate's toughness damage is the same as all of the other normies, his enhanced basic attack absolutely shreds through the toughness bar. On three stacks, it manages to do double the toughness damage than a normal ultimate. That's the basic attack doing double a normal ultimate. And so therefore, coming back to this light cone over here, he is way more likely to get this damage buff from weakness breaking than other characters. As for the other light cones, Clara's one is decent, the Mole's one is okay, but I would definitely default to the fall of an Aeon, especially because it's free to play, it's from her to store, anybody can get it up to S5 relatively easily. All right, lastly, we've got Eidolons. And so the TLDR is that E1, you get more stacks, therefore more damage. E2 actually gets you turn manipulation therefore more damage and better SP economy thanks to the extra charge. E4 again more damage because of better consistency and then E6 gives you giga giga damage. I gotta say though this E6 is kind of out of this world because you can get up to 60% imaginary resistance penetration and elemental resistance penetration is actually probably one of the hardest stats to get in the game right now. To be honest he works extremely well at E0 already but if you did have some cash to drop I mean in this economy E2 is probably what I'd be looking for in terms of like an optimal stopping point point. and that my guys is number 12 whichever way it is. In summary, I think he is a fantastic DPS, and if you are going to roll for him, let us know down in the comments below. Otherwise, that does bring us to the end of the video. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'll catch you guys in the next one. Bye-bye.